go ahead. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the seventh UQM uh, summer seminar series. Uh, today, uh, we are very happy to have Sagar Vijay and uh, Michael Gulans, um, who are going to talk about their latest research. Uh, our first speaker is Sagar Vijay from uh, UC Santa Barbara, and he's going to tell us about measurement driven entanglement transition in all to all quantum dynamics. Sagar, please go ahead. Um, okay, great. Um, so th thank you all for coming uh, and for having me at this uh, um, uh, UQM uh, seminar. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a dynamical phase transition in all to all uh, quantum dynamics that's driven by uh, projective measurements along with a, a new kind of volume law entangled phase uh, that shows up in the steady state uh, in these uh, dynamics. So um, this work is um, based on uh, the archive posting that's listed uh, on this slide. So um, just to begin, uh, I, I think, um, let's see, one second. Um, right, so um, to begin, um, thermalization uh, is a fairly generic paradigm for the dynamics of, of a, well, sufficiently general quantum system. That is, uh, if I start off in uh, a product initial state and I evolve uh, my system according to sufficiently generic unitary dynamics, then I'll lose all local information about the initial state and develop volume law entanglement. Uh, and this process is often referred to as thermalization and to refer um, to make reference to the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. If this unitary evolution is really generated by uh, Hamiltonian dynamics and the initial state is at some finite energy density with respect to this Hamiltonian, then local observables will also eventually reach their thermal expectation values uh, in the steady state. Um, and uh, this um, Thermalization that has been observed in a generic setting in local and random unitary uh, dynamics where the um, steady state really resembles a random page state. Uh, and this um, paradigm uh, for thermalization um, has been thought about deeply uh, recently. Um, and we now know that this uh, thermalization and the development of volume law entanglement can be arrested uh, or slowed down in many different situations. And one of those situations uh, is in unitary dynamics with repeated projective measurements. Uh, this was originally pointed out in the two papers um, here by Lee et al. and Skinner et al. on the slide. Uh, and uh, there are other scenarios in, in um, where uh, the finite energy density eigenstates of a Hamiltonian can appear to uh, not obey ETH uh, and other kinds of dynamics with disorder uh, without any measurements where uh, thermalization can also be avoided, but here I'll focus on the case with repeated projective measurements. Um, in practice, what this means is that I have a quantum system that's evolving according to local unitary quantum circuit dynamics. So this is a discrete time unitary dynamics. Uh, but in addition to the unitary gates that uh, entangle the system, um, there are also randomly applied local projective measurements. Uh, and these should be thought of as the influence of an environment that's being that's coupling itself uh, to the system, but the environment is uh, recording uh, observations about the system uh, so that the system itself always remains in a pure state. So in the absence of these local projective measurements, the initial state would thermalize uh, according to these dynamics, which is to say, since there are no conservation laws uh, and since um, the only structure in this unitary circuit is that the unitaries are applied locally. The uh, um, steady state in the absence of measurements will resemble a random state. Um, but with measurements um, and with a tunable rate of measurements, the result is, is very different. Uh, it's important that the measurement outcomes are recorded. If they're not recorded and we consider the mixed state density matrix uh, of the state uh, weighted by the probabilities for all of the measurement outcomes, uh, then that mixed state in general doesn't have any interesting structure. It'll be volume law entangled at late times. But um, 
This pure state exhibits a volume to area law entanglement phase transition as the rate of the projective measurements is tuned as was pointed out in, in these papers. Um, and uh, sorry that this is blocking part of the slide, but um, the, uh, as the rate of the projective measurements are, sorry. Uh, as the uh, rate of the applied projective measurements is tuned, uh, we eventually go into an area law uh, entangled phase uh, for this, this one dimensional system. And there's an alternative interpretation of this transition as a purification transition. If I consider a mixed initial state of the system, the density matrix of the initial state is, is mixed. And I can also do the same thing where I apply unitary gates and projective measurements. Uh, and as a function of the measurement rate, the initial state can purify at a constant rate or remain uh, a mixed um, state at very, very long times. Um, so uh, there are many, many papers that have been written about uh, the nature of this transition. Uh, and uh, in some limits, this transition can be related uh, to a percolation transition uh, by thinking about a minimal cut prescription through this uh, quantum circuit. Uh, but um, instead of discussing the transition, I want to highlight an interesting feature of the volume law entangled phase that emerges in the steady state when the rate of repeated projective measurements is sufficiently low. So the steady state volume law entangled phase is actually very distinct from a random uh, page state. Uh, and one of the ways uh, in which this uh, state is different from a random page state is that the von Neumann entanglement entropy uh, of a large subsystem of the steady state uh, will generally have this sort of scaling. A is the, the subsystem of interest and this is the size of the subsystem. So the entanglement entropy will have a volume law leading piece, which is expected uh, from in a random page state. However, the subleading, there's a subleading contribution which grows logarithmically in the size of the subsystem along with other subleading corrections. Uh, this is originally pointed out in numerical studies of, of these dynamics by, by Lee et al. And this is, of course, very different from the entanglement entropy in a random page state, which will only generically have the volume law piece. Um, and the reason for this logarithmic subleading correction is intimately tied to the fact that uh, this volume law entangled phase is actually robust against a finite rate of measurements. Um, and it's been shown, for example, that within a mean field description, uh, of this volume law entangled phase, this coefficient in front of the logarithm is actually quite, seems to be quantized throughout the volume law phase and is actually re related to the robustness of the volume law phase to the disentangling effects of repeated projective measurements. Uh, more precisely, if I take the steady state that's obtained uh, with a small rate of measurements uh, and I look at a subsystem in the steady state and I ask how the entanglement of that subsystem changes when I perform a projective measurement a distance x from the boundary of that subsystem. Then that change in the entanglement entropy uh, will be a constant for a page state. The page state has no notion of locality. So whenever I perform a projective measurement, I decrease the entanglement of a subsystem that includes that degree of freedom by some constant amount. But in the steady state uh, of these dynamics, the uh, it appears within a mean field description of this volume law phase, which I won't go into uh, in depth, that the entanglement entropy of this subsystem decreases as a power law uh, away from the boundary of the subsystem. And this power is exactly the constant that appears in front of the logarithm. And you can see that if I integrate this different, this change in the entanglement over a large subsystem, then the change in the entanglement is going to be a constant so if I perform a large number of projective measurements within a subsystem, I only get a constant reduction in the entanglement of that subsystem in this steady state, as opposed to what would happen for a random page state. This is intimately related to the fact that in the next time step, if I apply local unitaries, I will now be able to recover that constant loss of the entanglement, uh, whereas I, I wouldn't be able to recover from the enormous loss of the entanglement when I perform projective measurements if I started off in a page state. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about the entanglement transition uh, driven by local projective measurements in few body, but non-local, which is all to all unitary dynamics. 
and in this context, the, there's also a uh, tra phase transition that's driven by projective measurements, but it has a very different character. Uh, when the rate of projective measurements is very low, uh, the steady state of the system is fully entangled in the sense that most degrees of freedom uh, belong to, or a finite fraction of the degrees of freedom belong to a state uh, that is irreducibly entangled and can't be written as a product state on any number of components. But when the measurement rate is very large, the state res resembles a, kind of a non-local product state over many separable components. Uh, and there's a different diagnostic for this phase transition, a different order parameter, uh, which isn't uh, simply the entanglement entropy of a subsystem, but the order parameter tests whether local projective measurements outside of two disjoint subsystems can actually boost the mutual information of those subsystems. Uh, and it can in the entangled phase and it can't in, in the separable phase. Um, and furthermore, there's a family of exactly solvable models in which this transition occurs and uh, one can study this local order parameter. And uh, part of the reason to study this is to understand what other kinds of volume law entangled phases can be stabilized with a small rate of projective measurements. And the fully entangled phase that shows up here at a small rate of measurements is indeed very distinct from a page state, uh, but in ways that are very different from in one spatial dimension. Um, and finally, that there's a, an interesting sampling task that seems to become classically hard in the fully entangled phase, but that becomes uh, easy in the separable phase. So this um, type of transition could be an interesting benchmarking task for noisy intermediate scale um, quantum computers. So um, to begin, if I give you a pure state and I ask um, when are two subsystems entangled um, with each other, uh, I first want to answer um, how I would uh, diagnose the separability of a pure state um, by, by considering whether two subsystems are entangled with each other. And what I really mean by that is, given a pure state um, and given two disjoint subsystems, I want to ask, is there a bipartitioning of the system such that A and B belong to separable components of the pure state? That is to say, uh, this A subsystem belongs to a larger subsystem, which is completely disentangled from another subsystem, which includes B. Um, alternatively, there, there could be another scenario, which is just that A and B are, are irreducibly entangled. That is, there's no way that I can uh, partition the system so that A and B belong to separable components of, of this pure state. Um, and uh, there's a much more precise way to, to really phrase this question, which is um, a more precise characterization of this distinction between a separable and um, or fully entangled in a separable state is, is really given by thinking about the bottleneck and the entanglement between A and B, as I just mentioned. That is, I can consider all bipartitionings of this pure state um, into C and C complement, um, subject to the condition that C includes the A subsystem and doesn't include B. And I can ask uh, if, I mean, how the, which partition essentially minimizes the entanglement of this C subsystem and essentially reveals the bottleneck and the entanglement between A and B. And I can compare that to the actual entanglement of the A and B subsystems. Um, so th this all sounds uh, very complicated, uh, maybe, uh, but uh, the simplest uh, way to think about this possibly is um, to think about bell pairs. If I just have a bunch of uh, non-local bell pairs, uh, and the A and B subsystems are just some of the spins, um, of these bell pairs, uh, but none of the A spins are uh, in a pair with any of the spins in the B subsystem, then even though A and B have a high degree of entanglement, the bottleneck in their entanglement is really zero. Like the A subsystem is not entangled with the B subsystem. And so if I do this minimization, I'll, I'll find that this is zero, even though the entanglement of A and B is very large. So instead of trying to do this, instead of actually trying to minimize over all bipartitions to see whether A and B are entangled, there's a different diagnostic that I am proposing uh, that essentially diagnoses whether A and B belong to separable components or if they're fully entangled. And that is this quantity here, uh, which I'll call the entangling power for the rest of the talk. This, this quantity is the change in the mutual information between the A and B subsystems after performing local projective measurements outside of these subsystems in a sufficiently generic basis. 
So if, if psi is initially a very highly entangled state, the initial mutual information between two small subsystems A and B will be very close to zero. It'll be very small. Um, however, the intuition here is that if I perform projective measurements and A and B belong to an irreducibly entangled component of the state, then those measurements can actually boost the mutual information between A and B, whereas they can't if the state is actually separable. The intuition for this actually comes from measurement-based quantum computation. So in, in measurement-based quantum computation, projective measurements can be performed on an entangled state in order to generate entanglement between encoded logical qubits. Uh, so in that context, if you're smart about which measurements you're performing, you can boost the entanglement between certain degrees of freedom. Um, but here I'm, I'm claiming something a little bit more generic, which is that even though this isn't the um, code state for uh, um, in, a, in a quantum computer that in a sufficiently generic basis, performing measurements will still be able to entangle A and B in such a way that they gain some information about each other. There's um, a, many examples of this uh, that one can go through in order to convince yourself that this is a reasonable diagnostic. So a, a very simple example or the smallest example I can think about is a, a foresight cluster state. Um, so the cluster state is a, um, uh, a stabilizer state. Um, it's a, a symmetry protected topological phase under a Z2 cross Z2 um, uh, Ising symmetry. But here I'm just considering the cluster state on, on four sites. Uh, and that state is defined uh, by the solution to these eigenvalue problems. It's the simultaneous eigenstate of these four operators here. Um, this is a state for which each of the four spins is, is very highly entangled. Um, and in fact, each spin is, is maximally entangled. And if I look at the mutual information of, um, let's say the first spin and the third spin, that mutual information is actually zero. Uh, but the interesting thing is that if I uh, measure spins two and four in the Pauli X basis, then this projects spins one and three into a bell pair. So a projective measurement of spins two and four actually boosts the mutual information between spins one and three. So it becomes maximal. It's, it's just two log two. Of course, um, this ability of the measurements to boost the mutual information between spins one and three is impossible if I just consider the state of four spins where one and two are in a bell pair and three and four are in a bell pair. And in this case, if I measure uh, the spins um, two and four, then I'll just project one and three into a product state and they'll have they'll be completely disentangled. So the mutual information doesn't change at all in this procedure. Um, there are other examples of, of this as well. So in a random tensor network state, if I consider two subsystems A and B, and um, I ask how the mutual information between them changes if I perform projective measurements, then um, if the bond dimension of that tensor network state is sufficiently large, then a minimal cut prescription for calculating the entanglement tells you that the change in the mutual information between A and B is precisely this uh, bottleneck entanglement, which is the minimization of the entanglement entropy um, over all partitions that include A but don't include B. Okay, so, so now that we have some diagnostic for the separability of a pure state, I'll jump to all to all dynamics with measurements. So I'm going to um, talk about a toy model in which of all to all quantum circuit dynamics with projective measurements where there's a sharp phase transition in this separability property of the steady state as the rate of projective measurements is tuned. I'm sorry, um, I have a quick question. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. Just uh, um, you, you said uh, that you, you showed by example that the, by projecting on uh, systems outside of A and B, um, you could boost the, the mutual information. Is it always yeah. an increase of mutual information or sometimes it would decrease? Um, um, it, it could de decrease, but I'm, so what I'm assuming here is that um, uh, I'm in a very entangled state and A and B are some small finite subsystems for which yes. the mutual information is initially going to be zero or very close to zero to begin with. Oh, so, okay. yeah, so in that case, right, I, I could only boost the mutual information, but it's also true that if the mutual information were non-zero uh, mm -hmm. then measurements outside could also decrease the mutual information. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yes. So really this should be um, a more general diagnostic would be whether you can change the mutual information uh, in measure of that. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Right. 
Right. So, um, so there's in, in all to all circuit dynamics with projective measurements, there's a sharp change in the separability of the steady state in the way that I mentioned earlier as the rate of projective measurements is tuned. Um, and um, what I really mean is, uh, as I said earlier, in the fully entangled phase when in all to all circuit dynamics with a low rate of measurement, um, there's a finite fraction of the degrees of freedom that participate in an irreducibly entangled state, whereas um, in the separable phase, the state is really a non-local product state. Um, now, both of these phases are actually a bit more subtle. The fully entangled phase is very different from a page state, uh, and the separable phase is actually a little bit different from a very simple product state over finitely many, finite, finite um, where each uh, component of the product state is over um, just a finite number of degrees of freedom, but I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute. So there's an exactly solvable model uh, um, family of models rather for the space transition, which I'll refer to as instantaneous quantum polynomial time dynamics. Um, and this is motivated by uh, what are called IQP, instantaneous quantum polynomial time quantum circuits, uh, which have been studied in the quantum information context. So the, these dynamics I can uh, think of, um, I can write in the following way. So the initial state is a product state of n spins in the Pali X basis. Uh, so they all point to the right. Um, and uh, at each time step, I apply a two-site unitary gate between a randomly chosen pair of spins. And this two-site unitary gate just gives me a phase if the two spins point down and it doesn't do anything otherwise. So it's a control phase gate in the Z basis. Uh, so this is a gate that doesn't generate any entanglement in the Pali Z basis, but it does generate entanglement when it acts on spins that are in the X basis. Um, after this, um, or a, one, a small thing is if, if this phase factor is pi and I pick up a minus sign when the two spins point down, then this unitary gate is in the Clifford group for the spin. So it's a control Z gate. So when I apply the two site unitary gates, it doesn't matter if I choose phi to be the same for the unitary gates I apply or if I choose phi to be different. Uh, the results I'm going to talk about are, are going to be the same. So throughout the dynamics, it could be changing phi uh, or I could keep phi fixed. Um, but the results for the transition at least are, are going to be identical. So after I apply a two site unitary gate between a randomly chosen pair of spins, um, maybe a few randomly chosen pairs of spins, then with probability P, I'll measure um, a random spin in the Pauli Z basis and then rotate the spin back into the Pauli, Pauli X basis. So if I perform a measurement, say this spin, it'll, it'll put the spin um, up or down since I'm measuring the Pauli Z basis. Um, but the problem is that if the spin is in the Pauli Z basis, then this unitary won't generate any entanglement uh, for the spin when it acts um, on this spin. So I'll rotate it into the X basis so that it can continue to entangle with the remaining spins. Um, so so this, this dynamics is actually is fairly simple. Um, the unitary uh, on its own is a sort of classical unitary in the sense that it doesn't generate any entanglement in the Z basis. But these dynamics taken together do uh, generate entanglement because the rotation of the spin into the Pauli X basis doesn't commute with the unitary. Um, right. So the interesting property of this dynamics is that the evolving state of the spins in the Pauli Z basis always takes the following form. So um, I have N spins. Uh, and first what I'll do is um, just as a technical point, I'll um, represent the state of each spin in the Pauli Z basis by a binary degree of freedom, which is zero or one. So if the spin at side I is in a state that um, points up, then SI is zero if it points down, then SI is, is one. Um, this is just another rep way to represent a state in the Pauli Z basis for the spins. Uh, and the amplitude for the wave function to be in this state at a given time T is always going to be given by this expression here, or D is the Hilbert space dimension of the system is two to the N. So here, um, theta of T is an N by N matrix, uh, and it's naturally thought of as a weighted graph on, on N nodes. Uh, and it, it should, should be understood as an N by N matrix with entries taken modulo two pi. And W of T is a, a vector, an N component vector also with entries mod mod two pi. And the evolution of this graph theta of t entirely determines the entanglement properties of the state. And the evolution of this graph can be, the dynamical rules for the evolution of this graph can be written down exactly uh, for the dynamics that I mentioned. Um, 
And this evolution can be studied analytically. The reason why the vector doesn't contribute to the entanglement is it should be clear. It's, it's because a single qubit, a series of single qubit uh, unitary gates can remove this phase from the wave function. Um, and that won't change the entanglement properties of the state at all. So, okay, so now the wave function has a graphical representation. Uh, when the gates that I'm applying are control Z gates, then this is often referred to as a graph state. Uh, but more generally for IQP dynamics uh, like this, um, uh, essentially that uh, I guess what I'm saying here is for these dynamics where you have both unitary operators and projective measurements, the state at a given time T can always be written as a unitary operator acting on the initial state where the unitary depends on the measurement outcomes. Uh, and those measurement outcomes go into theta and W. Okay, so, um, so I have a weighted graph on n nodes and it's the dynamics of this graph that I want to study to determine the entanglement properties uh, of the state. Uh, and the dynamical rules for this graph are, are um, an oversimplification of them is kind of the following. If I apply a unitary gate between two spins I and J, then the corresponding nodes in the graph are going to be connected by a bond. Uh, and if I perform a measurement, a projective measurement on site K, then the bonds emanating from that node are going to be removed. So this is a sort of visual representation of the disentangling and entangling effects uh, that the measurements have in, in the dynamics. Right. So a phase transition and the separability of the steady state occurs and actually corresponds to a percolation transition for this graph. Um, as the measurement rate is tuned. And this phase transition point can be determined analytically by studying exactly the, um, by analytically studying the dynamics of this graph and it's at a uh, measurement rate or measurement of probability of P critical equal to two thirds. This is much larger than the um, critical strength of measurements needed to go into the aerial law phase uh, with local unitary dynamics and projective measurements in one spatial dimension. Um, but then again, we are thinking about the, the sort of separability of the wave function here, which is um, would be a little bit different. Uh, so the phase transition point can be determined analytically. And the, the reason is actually that the, um, the distribution of node degrees in this graph satisfies a very simple rate equation that can be solved uh, exactly. Um, and the properties of the percolation transition point correspond to sort of interesting properties of the wave function. So one of them is the number of fully entangled clusters of spins decays as a power law in that cluster size at the critical point with a universal power. Um, so the number density of clusters of spins of, of, uh, which involve K spins decays as K to the minus five halves uh, when K is much larger than one um, at the critical point. And you can numerically check this in Clifford dynamics uh, when that phase I was talking about earlier is pi with measurements. Uh, that these and other observables do appear to satisfy the scaling forms that one would expect to see in mean field or random graph percolation. Um, now the entangling power order parameter that I talked about earlier also seems to behave um, correctly uh, in these dynamics. So if I choose two spins, uh, one spin is A and the other spin is B, and I perform projective measurements in C, but those measurements are in a generic basis with respect to these dynamics. And that means that they can't be in the Z basis. They have to be in the Pali X basis. Then as the measurement rate is tuned, you can see that this change in the mutual information goes from being something of order one in units of log two uh, to zero um, as the rate is increased. The interesting thing is that for Clifford dynamics, this order parameter is actually related to an operator in the percolation picture. So it's related to what's called a local complementation operation at the percolation transition. So I, I take my graph and for every measurement performed in C, uh, I take the corresponding nodes and uh, I um, look at the neighbors of those nodes uh, and I reconnect them in a very particular way. Uh, and after doing that, I ask um, if A and B are, are connected. Uh, after this complicated procedure. Uh, and that's the operator whose expectation value I'm essentially measuring by measuring this order parameter. So this order parameter has some scaling collapse at the critical point with some exponents. But unfortunately, these exponents, I uh, don't really know how to make sense of because I've not seen this operator studied in um, mean field or, or random graph percolation. Um, so in the in the time that I have left, I just want to focus on properties of this entangled phase that occurs uh, that, that we can look at when the measurement rate is sufficiently low. 
So as I said before, in the fully entangled phase, a finite fraction of the spins belongs to a fully entangled pure state. And this fraction uh, disappears as I approach the transition point from below as P minus PC. Um, the fully entangled phase is very different from a random page state for many reasons. From the graphical picture of the wave function, um, you can analytically show that the steady state only requires, so there are n spins, the steady state only requires order n two site unitary gates in order to be prepared from a product initial state, uh, which is very, very small compared to a page state. Uh, and in fact, if I impose locality, order n local two site unitary gates in, a, in some spatial dimension would only give me area law entanglement, right? Um, so these gates can, uh, in addition, um, the entanglement structure of the state is very special. These gates can be applied in a locally tree-like fashion, which is to say, if I um, start off in a state in the, uh, a product state in the X basis, the steady state can always be prepared by applying two site gates uh, that connect pairs of spins, uh, but the gates themselves don't form any loops locally. Uh, so the, um, uh, essentially the, if I think about this as a graph, the neighbor of my neighbor uh, is never going to be um, is never going to be this site, uh, and so there there are going to be no loops in this sort of graph that I can construct by applying these unitaries. These gates can be applied in a locally tree-like fashion, but the two-site unitary gates um, also form loops that are very long range that are of length order log n. Um, so it's a very special structure for this entangled state uh, that locally the unitary gates are applied in a tree-like way, but that spins that are uh, separated by a depth uh, of order log n are also connected um, in, by these two side gates. But in practice, what this actually means is that the fully entangled phase is actually, interestingly, very fragile compared to a random page state. Um, and this is kind of, uh, uh, in, in a way, this sounds like the opposite of what happens in one spatial dimension. Um, and what I mean by fragile is that measuring a finite fraction of the spins in this steady state will actually disentangle the remaining spins. So the unmeasured spins will actually form a separable state over a small number where each um, separable component involves a finite number of spins. Um, whereas in a page state, if I measured a finite fraction of the spins, the remaining states will still probably be irreducibly entangled. They're not going to form a separable state. Uh, so this is somewhat reminiscent of the quantum disentangled liquid, which uh, uh, Tarun um, and Matthew um, Fisher studied a long time ago, where measuring a certain fraction of the degrees of freedom in certain volumal entangled phases can um, put the rest of the degrees of freedom into an area law state. And, and here it's something similar. You measure half the system, uh, and the remaining degrees of freedom will, will be projected into a separable state, even though the original state is fully entangled. So that's actually a diagnostic that differentiates this steady state from a, a page state, um, whereas the other order parameter I referred to earlier is the one that differentiates this from a, a purely separable state. So um, in the remaining time that I left, I'll just mention that this toy model specifically can provide a possible benchmarking task for um, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. So just because I have knowledge of the steady state amplitudes in the wave function in the toy model, um, that doesn't mean that I can calculate all properties of the state using a classical computer. So consider, for example, the probability of being a, in a product state in the X basis, um, which is given by summing all of the amplitudes in the wave function and then squaring it. Um, so, so calculating this probability is as hard as calculating the partition function for an Ising model, which has complex weights uh, on, a, on a graph that's specified by theta. Um, and it's, it's known that if theta is a random graph, that this is, um, it is, this is believed to be classically hard to compute. Um, and there's a complexity classification that this is supposed to be sharp P hard to, uh, to compute. Um, but the interesting thing is that if the graph contains, this graph theta contains no loops, so it's not really a, a random graph which contains loops of order log n, if it's a graph that contains no loops, then certain sampling tasks can be performed easily. And a simple example is, is given by the following. I can actually take the, this state, psi of t, uh, and apply some single qubit gates um, 
and measure the probability that this state is in a product state that's polarized along the x direction. Um, the role of the single qubit gates is just to make this state psi of t uh, z2 symmetric. Um, so it's invariant under a spin flip operation of all the spins. Um, the reason for that is because then I can rewrite this probability as the, of course, the partition function for an Ising model with the z2 symmetry, but on a graph that contains no loops. Um, and even though the weights are complex, you can convince yourself that this can be calculated easily and it's just given by the cosine squared of the uh, different weights that show up in this adjacency matrix of the graph, taking the product over all the bonds in the graph. So if the graph contains no loops, then certain sampling tasks become analytically tractable uh, or can be performed easily. But for a random graph, this is classically hard. So this uh, sampling, th this probability to return to this particular initial state, um, uh, of course, um, Comparing the actual probability with this number um, provides an interesting way of, of seeing whether you're in the separable or entangled phase in this problem and is um, something that becomes cl classically hard in the fully entangled phase. Okay, so, um, so just to summarize, there's an, uh, an entanglement transition in few body but non-local all to all unitary dynamics with randomly applied local projective measurements and it's related to mean field percolation. Uh, in a very different way from the way that the 1D entanglement area law to volume law transition in the presence of projective measurements is related to a percolation problem through a minimal cut prescription. Um, the entangling power of projective measurements is a useful order parameter for this transition. And there's a family of exactly solvable models in which the wave function evolves according to a very simple graphical representation. Although studying this transition in potentially more generic models would be useful to see if this is really the universality class of this transition more generally, or if the transition survives more generally. Um, and the fully entangled phase is very different from a page state in this sort of tree-like structure. Um, and uh, has a sort of behavior that's very simple to, or very similar some, somewhat to the um, quantum disentangled liquid that has been talked about previously. Um, and there's a sampling task. And I want to um, acknowledge a few people um, Rihua, Fan, Dijuang, and Ashwin for uh, previous work and discussions, um, and also Adam Nahum, Michael Gullens, and David Hughes for um, useful discussions as well. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you, Sagar. Uh, now we have uh, uh, like one minute for a very quick question. Uh, I have a question, uh, yeah. Sagar. Um, so you mentioned this entangling power uh, as an order parameter, I was wondering, uh, are more standard measures such as, suppose you look at the reduced density matrix of, of A union B and, uh, and look at something like some mixed state measure for that, for example, um, negativity or something where you partially yeah. transpose, does that also work or it doesn't work? Yeah, so I, I tried, um, that's a good question. So that it doesn't seem like the negativity works. Um, so there are examples, counter examples using these few qubit states like the, I'm sorry, I'm not pulling up the slide, but using some of these like cluster states and things where you can, you can see that um, A union B, the density matrix for A union B is the same for two different states. Um, and in one, A and B are part of disentangled components and, and the other A and B are part of an irreducibly entangled component. So I, I think there is a way that probably one can think about this entangling power as some conditional mutual information, but that's something that I'm still um, working right, on. right. That was the thing. I mean, yeah, because there's a relation yeah. between conditional mutual information and also this QDL kind of. Yeah, right. Uh, is a right. bound. Um, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that's a good point. Um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, let's uh, move on to the next talk. Thank you, Sagar, again. <laughs>